Hey guys, this is Dante Stack. When I initially released these episodes week by week, after part one, I released a noob recap episode. As quickly as possible, I just tried to recap the events of the first 18 episodes so that people could jump into part two without having listened to part one. If you're interested in listening to that noob recap, go to DanteStack.com slash podcast dash extras and scroll down until you see the appropriate noob recap. Also, after episode 18, we took a bunch of fan questions and I answered them in a special premium Q&A type podcast episode. We called that a Solving the World special. You can purchase that for 99 cents on our store at DanteStack.com slash store. It's real easy to buy. It's just a quick download. Um, and if you're the type that just is gobbling up Solve the World, it gives you some deeper insight it's kind of like the behind the scenes special features on a DVD type of situation. So, once again, both those things you can find at dantestack.com. If you just want to scroll around the website, if you just want to scroll around the website, be sure to click on the Solve the World tab and scroll through all the pages under that heading. Thanks and enjoy the show. Solve the World, episode 18. Letter to Atticus. Dear Atticus, I never wrote down your address, so I hope this finds its way to you. Maybe Red Jeb will get it to you. I actually know him. He's a good guy. A crazy old, good-natured man. I think I really like old people. They don't try to hide as much as the rest of us. Believe it or not, the last few days I've ran into several older people of considerable power. It's been eye-opening, that's for sure. I wonder if you still think about me. I wanted to tell you how great it was to meet you. And you were so kind, and your family is so adorable. I think your little sister's smarter than me. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little envious and overwhelmed with Scout's cunning. She's got a straight head on her shoulders, that's for sure. And so do you. Your dad does too. That was really sweet of you to talk your dad into helping me out. I would have been lost if it wasn't for the two of you. You and the further guidelines have been with me every step of my journey. I pretty much have memorized all of them by now. But I'm ashamed to say I've already broken several of them. Atticus... I don't really have any friends in this life. I hope it's okay to write to you and to tell you about my adventures. And believe you me, they are adventures. I'm not the type of girl that would ever write in a diary, but I need some way of organizing my thoughts, of calculating where I've been and where I'm going. Don't forget, you and your father wrote guideline number eight. When escaping, know beforehand what you're escaping to. I've had to do a lot of escaping already, so I'm going to tell you everything. But you don't have to read this if you don't want to. You can stop reading now. I won't hold it against you. Promise. When I run, I run for my life. I kissed a boy. It was my first kiss. It was really, really, really nice. He just came up to me one day. I'd never met him, and he kissed me, just like that, and I kissed him back. He asked me out to a fancy date. I said yes. I was so giddy, I thought I was going to burst. It was a love story happening in real time, and I was the princess at the center of it. I thought it was a dream come true. Maybe it was a dream, but it didn't end up being the good type. Once Tiff attacked me and I started hallucinating in the bathroom, I knew for certain that my fairy tale was spiraling toward a nightmarish ending. Ah... If I only knew that Tiff was alright. If I just knew that, I think everything would be okay. But I don't know that. Everything turned out sour, Atticus. It really did. When I got to California, when I got off the train in Los Angeles, it suddenly hit me that I didn't have any plan. There was no road map for me to follow. I didn't even know how to get to the ocean from the train station. I didn't have a car or any money or even a compass. I really could have used a compass. So... I just walked. I walked, and I walked, and I walked. It was a weird feeling. I was amongst a suburban sea of strangers. It felt like everyone was looking at me, judging me for not having a game plan. I felt like such a fool, Atticus. 
I mean, what was I doing? Just another stupid blonde girl coming to California. No family, no friends, no food. It was really scary. Then I met this guy, Flesher. I'm not totally sure, but he seemed like he probably had some sort of deeply rooted mental problems. He, he certainly didn't have any social skills. He kept asking me if he could be my girlfriend. Then he introduced me to his, quote, sister, unquote, Tiff. I thought Tiff was nice. She seemed to have street smarts, like the tramp from Lady and the Tramp. I got this feeling that if only I could just pal around with her, I'd be able to eat and be okay. She was a child of the street, so she intuitively knew how things work at the very ground level. You know what I mean? Anyway, she and Flusher took me to food, which ended up being maybe a hundred feet underground. It wasn't a sewer, at least I don't think. It was this insanely intricate underground passageway, where lots and lots of homeless made camp and lived. Flush and Tiff took me down there to meet their leader, a big, big, big man just named Patriot. You know, Patriot, like Cher or Madonna. He was just Patriot. And he sure was fat. Alright, so the next part is where the information I'm telling you could potentially get us both in trouble. So just keep it to yourself, okay? When you run, run for your life. This Patriot runs an underground, supposedly centuries old, organization called the Patriots. It's kind of like a homeless mafia. And they're in cahoots with the CIA. When the CIA needs to know really low things, like undercover cops type stuff, I guess they talk to the Patriots and the Patriots get the info for them. Something like that. And then I heard all about a rival gang. Though truth be told, I never even met one of them, so they could be imaginary for all I know. Called Parrots. The Parrots are the inside gang for the FBI. So apparently, the FBI and the CIA have this deep, deep rivalry, hence the need to have distinct homeless gangs out in the West. So the Patriot liked me. He chose to employ me as the secret agent. What was I going to say? I didn't know any better. It sounded fun to be a spy. And he offered me a place to stay, above ground, daily food, and a really cool job. And he didn't actually tell me what I was spying on. He just said, here, take this job at Magical Kingdom. You'll be the park's pride and joy. You get to be the Cleopatra. So I said yes. Being Cleopatra was really fun. It was long days, but pretty much I just sat on a giant mechanical giraffe, all glistening in a pretty dress, and smiled and waved at the crowd. Multiple times a day. And that was it. I named the mechanical giraffe Claude. For a few days, I thought I was living out of fantasy. The only weird part was that the Patriot made Tiff my roommate. Except she had to be a janitor at the theme park, not a movie starlet like me. I think she was pretty jealous of me from the beginning. Okay, then this weirdo attacked Claude and me. I fell off and Claude broke. Something was wrong with his neck and it kept smashing its head on the street until its head was smashed to smithereens. It was kind of traumatizing. So this guy, an Arab Muhammad something or other, he just went berserk and attacked the giraffe. I guess he had a bad experience with giraffes or something like that. Later that day, this dude's lawyer came and harassed me at the hotel. I thought I was experiencing the weirdest series of events ever. But I was wrong. The park replaced Claude with a real elephant named Huck. Huck was a sweetie. I liked riding him more than the mechanical giraffe. Except, Huck made me sore at the end of the day. Anyway, that's when I figured out my real mission. I was sent to Magical Kingdom to uncover the identity and location of their new attraction, set to open on November 1st, the Veneration Celebration. But I had no idea how to find out information like that. So I figured I'd just keep being the beautiful Cleopatra and eventually everything would work itself out. Well, it did. Because that's when Antonio D'Anconia showed up and kissed me. When I run, I run for my life. I didn't have a clue who he was. He was just this hot, wonderfully dressed guy who was kissing me. And he smelled so nice. Sorry, should I be talking about this to you? Is it weird? I run, I run for my life. But not to win some degraded prize. When you run, run for your life. He invited me the same day he met me and kissed me to a late night date in St. Drogo's. 
I didn't know he was the son of the theme park's owner. How was I supposed to know that? I didn't even know his name at the time. Even if I did, I didn't know Danconia meant Magical Kingdom, Inc. So I met him. Well, wait. It was a big ordeal. I convinced the Patriot to get me a fancy dress. Do you know about St. Jorgo's? It's like the fanciest coffee house in the world, but they also serve food and whatnot. I've been told that most people have to get a reservation at least a year in advance to get in. It's called the Seventh Peak of Magical Kingdom. My peak, St. Denise, was the sixth. And it's like the big mansion with a big picket fence around it. It was really beautiful inside, but to be honest, kind of stagnant. It didn't feel alive at all. Just dead air. Antonio was a perfect gentleman until after the meal. He took me upstairs in the mansion to a bedroom. I told him no, Atticus. He said he respected that, but I could tell I surprised him. We talked for a while, and I went home thinking I let him down. Okay, back up. So you gotta understand. The Patriot is pretty much a mob boss, and so he has to act the part. Meaning, you can't get something for nothing from him. Everything comes at a cost. When I asked him to help me get a fancy dress, he agreed as long as I did a task for him. So the next night after my date, I had to take a photo and put it on this board in some old lady's house up in Santa Barbara. I had to sneak into this lady's house in the middle of the night, Atticus. I had to be a burglar. And weirder still, the photo Patriot gave me was of Tiffin Flusher. He didn't tell me what this task was all about, he just told me to do it. So I did. But when I got there, he did give me keys in this clicker thing to get over this moat. Long story. The old lady that lived there apparently was waiting for me. Turned out she was Mrs. Moose. I assumed you've heard of her? I hadn't, but I didn't really read books growing up. I learned all about her later. So, if you don't know, she's this famous cartoonist who got famous making all these children books about cats that had human faces. Not like real human faces. It was just that in her universe of books, everyone was a cat, and every cat had the face of a human. She showed me her most famous book, The Cat and the Bat. It rhymed and stuff. It was kind of funny, but I didn't get what all the fuss was about. Anyway, nowadays she's like a million years old and she draws political cartoons for the Los Angeles Times. Little did I know, I was giving her the photograph so that she could use the picture of Flush to draw him into a cartoon as a hint to the CIA to take him out. So, I was the middleman in like a mafia takeout. I feel bad for Flusher a little bit now, but I heard later that Tiff and him were apparently double agents, selling themselves out to the parents. I know, super complicated, right? So, I did my job and everything mostly went back to normal. Except that Antonio apologized and asked me out on another date. I said yes. I really liked him. I wanted to spend more time with him. I wanted to see where the fates were taking the two of us. That night, he took me to the secret new ride. We went on it. And it's an amazing ride, Atticus. You should go on it. I'd love to show it to you. Really, I'd love that. But then, kind of during the ride, or after, I'm a little bit fuzzy how things went down. He climbed on top of me. He, he was going to rape me, Atticus. And here's the weirdest part. When Flush was taken by the CIA, Tiff, like, went crazy. She was just going berserk in our apartment. I locked myself in the bathroom to get away from her. And then, and then I was visited, or I hallucinated, or I fell asleep, or, or something. I don't really know what happened. Whatever the case, this man appeared to me, and he told me that something was going to happen, and that when it did, I would know it. And what I had to do was scream. Like, scream at the top of my lungs. I can't explain it, but when Antonio was on me, I knew what I had to do because of this guy that talked to me in my sleep. I screamed over and over until my throat hurt. But you see, that started a whole mixed salad of events. These security people came and saved me from Antonio, but they didn't care about me. They didn't care that Antonio just tried to rape me. All they cared about was that I knew about their precious veneration celebration. I was obstinate. I didn't want to tell them anything. So they decided to punish me. They cut off all my hair. Yep, that's right. I have a forced buzz cut. I'm glad you can't see me now. Hopefully my hair will be grown back before you see me again. It was horrible. And then, worse still, they injected me with poison. I didn't know it at the time. This, this man in black said it was some sort of GPS... But I learned differently. Eventually, they let me go. I went back to the hotel and Tiff was waiting. She had been stalking me and was going to kill me if I didn't tell her everything. But it didn't matter. She was insane. She attacked me. You have to understand, I had just been through so much. I think on a regular day, a good regular day, 
I could have taken her. I could have fought the good fight against her. But, but I was so, so tired. We fought, and we fought. And I ran away. I thought if I could reach the bathroom, I could maybe lock her out. After all, I'd done that once before. But as I ran, Tiff kicked me in the back. I fell, and I hit my head on the pipes underneath the sink. I was conscious just long enough to feel the back of my head bursting with blood. Then everything just went dark. Can you imagine what that felt like? What I went through? It was as if the whole world was out to terrorize me, Atticus. And then, I awoke in a sterile, white room, with my arms splayed out. I was in the basement of Mrs. Moose's house. She had configured me so that one arm splayed out over a little baby pool. On that arm, she had cut my wrist and was draining all the blood out of me. Can you imagine? All the while, she had my other arm hooked up to an IV of fresh blood. For some reason, she happened to keep a fridge full of pure blood on hand. I don't know, maybe she's a vampire. But she used the blood to nurse me back to health. The Magical Kingdom people had poisoned my bloodstream. Mrs. Moose gave me new blood. After a while, once I was feeling better, the Patriot and his friends came. They locked me in the trunk of this limousine, handcuffed me, and took me to Las Vegas. They thought they were going to make money off the secrets I knew, but they didn't know that the CIA was actually double-crossing them. It was all set up, Atticus. Everyone wants power for themselves, like everyone. Then they took me, that is, the CIA, and they were going to waterboard me or something, but I was so tired I fell asleep in the jail cell. And when I woke up, all the doors were empty and no one was around. I walked out of that prison, just like that. And then Lilith Babbitt was there to meet me. Lilith also wanted my secrets, but she was nicer than everyone else. She didn't threaten me. Actually, she's putting me on a boat, Atticus. The next letter you get from me will be from Brazil or the South Pole or somewhere else in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Lilith asked me what I wanted most. I told her that I'm trying to figure out this world. You know, I'm trying to solve the world. All of it. Lilith liked that idea and said I was a grand person for having such lofty goals. She said she's funding an exploration boat full of genius people that are all working on solving different life problems. So tomorrow, I'm flying up to San Francisco to join the crew of the Orion. Anyway, I've probably rambled on long enough. I guess... I guess I've told you pretty much everything. Oh, oh, one more thing. When I was with Mrs. Moose, I asked her who she was and what she believed about the Earth. She told me that the whole of history has been a battle between order and entropy. She says if either side rules, there'll be horrible consequences. So she spends all her efforts trying to keep all the systems and all the powers of this world at odds and equal. She told me that if there isn't war, then the oncoming peace is the thing to dread. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's, it's not that she's a war hawk or loves human suffering or something like that quite the opposite. She just believes that human nature is built towards competition. So if there isn't any, that means either entropy or order has seized destiny. If entropy wins, then there is no human progress, and we revert back to our natural instincts. And then she said if order wins, freedom is eliminated. Okay, um, that's all. I miss you, Atticus, further. I'd like to see you again. Love, Jen Dash. Seldom had to run to preserve my own existence And ain't it sad to lose your breath after only a short distance The sharp pains in your gut cut like a knife When you run, run for your life
don't have to run for nothing And I would rather run to you Than run away from something Followed closely by a fiddle and a fight When you run, run for your life like to offer a very heartfelt thank you to the band The Show Ponies, who let us use the title track of their new EP called Run For Your Life. It's a great song, isn't it? If you'd like to listen to more of The Show Ponies, you can look them up on iTunes, go to theshowponies.com, or go to my website and I'll link you over to them. Thank you, Show Ponies, and for the other songs and sound effects we used for this week, as always, you can find attribution for those on our show notes page at dantestack.com. Thanks. Hello, I'm Ekin from Istanbul. I've listened to all 100 episodes of Jed's story. Jed's adventure amidst the kaleidoscope of marvels and magical kingdom has come to a close. The next chapter in our life will not be swallowed up by the wages of money and class warfare, but rather the wages of fear surfing the tides and undercurrents of the seven seas of the earth. Stay with me, stay with us, for we've only just begun to solve the world. <laughs>